Let's get it on then, shall we? Mwah. Welcome to Sex on the Peach, your weekly hump day dose of everyone's favourite untalked about topic, sex. Let's get honest, let's get open, let's get comfortable and let's get in to this week's show. Hello everyone, happy hump day. I'm your host Peach and welcome to today's episode of Sex on the Peach. Now, as mentioned last week, today's episode was originally planned to be about different relationship structures, i.e. monogamy, polyamory, but as we know, the absolute foundation of this podcast, and of me in general, is honesty and transparency. And that conversation is one that is super important to me and a very, very close to home topic for me. And I just haven't had the time this past week to prepare that conversation in the way that I want to. Between uni assignments and being back in rehearsals for a show, this past week really ran away from me in spectacular fashion. Also, as a lot of that conversation is based in my own personal experiences and journey, it's really important to me that I be in the right headspace to speak those out loud. And honestly... After some life curveballs these past couple of weeks, I'm not sure I've been quite there. So, we're going to put a pin in that episode for now. And as I always want to keep these conversations moving, I decided this week to do a sex Q&A and let people send in any and all sexual questions they may have. And I hope that someone else might hear an answer they need via another person's question that they still might not feel comfortable to ask yet. And I also hope people may feel more and more confident to send over their queries as we move through the episodes and people get used to me. There's quite a bit of variety in here today. So let's get into today's Ask Peach. Okay, here we go. Straight in. Question number one. Would you let someone pee on you during sex? Look, more power to absolutely anyone who is into that, but it's personally not really for me. I know there can still be quite a lot of judgment towards this, but golden showers or water sports, as they're also known, are actually a super common act of fetish play. So we can talk about that for a little minute. Because for anyone who does want to try it, it's usually the act of urinating directly from the body of one person onto their partner or partners. Although, I have also known it to be performed by urinating into a glass and then poured onto their partner or partners. It's primarily an act that takes place in a bath or bathroom, just as it can be super messy. But some people are sometimes also happy to play this out elsewhere and lay down protective materials. Sometimes people do choose to drink it, which reduces the mess. But obviously that is something that you would have to truly be happy to do. Don't ever feel pressured into that being the end goal if it isn't really for you. Golden showers are often linked to humiliation kinks as it's associated with private things that may be considered dirty. But sometimes people just like the smell, taste or even just the warm sensation of it. As it's a natural part of a person and their body, people sometimes find it creates a deeper connection between themselves and their partner or partners. And also, people just like what they like. So there are many reasons people might be into golden showers and if that is a particular fetish you're interested in, don't let anyone shame you or make you feel uncomfortable about it. It's not really for anyone other than your partner or partners to understand and as long as everything is consensual, you're more than welcome to try what you want. Golden showers are just as safe as any other kind of sexual contact. 
But that does mean, as you hopefully would with anything else sex related, make sure you're testing regularly and keeping on top of your sexual health. As if you have any kind of linked infections like a UTI or a yeast infection or HPV, it should be avoided just the same as any other play that is bonded by bodily fluids. But it is generally a lower risk activity. Obviously, make sure you communicate and set boundaries before engaging in any type of fetish play. And with golden showers particularly, I'd highly advise drinking a lot of water and staying on top of your hydration beforehand. It would just be a more pleasant experience for everyone all round. Question number two, something very different. When someone you have slept with has been accused of sexual misconduct ranging from being a creep to full-on sexual assault, what do you do when that wasn't your experience with them? That is a tough question, or more a tough situation to be a part of. Because really, you don't need to do anything. I'm not sure from this if anyone is expecting you to do anything, But if that wasn't your experience, then it wasn't your experience. As long as you aren't invalidating anyone else's experience with that person, just because yours didn't lie in that vein, there's honestly no reason for you to feel like you have to do anything. And I'm not entirely sure why anyone would expect you to. I know that I've had abusive partners in the past who've done really quite terrible things, but they have gone on to have further relationships and I'd like to believe that they haven't brought that behavior into those relationships and so if a latter partner of theirs were to tell me they had a great time and a safe and consensual sex life that doesn't invalidate the fact that I had a sex life with them that was unsafe and abusive so you don't have to lie about it but also you don't have to speak about it at all if you don't want to No one has rights to your life and you can talk or not talk about whatever you wish. I do understand that this must be an uncomfortable situation to be a part of and I'm also sending love and strength to all of those who have been affected by that person in a manner that was not safe or consensual and just because that wasn't your experience with that person doesn't mean that your support can't be extended to those who've clearly had a very different experience. Sadly, people can change and their behaviours can evolve in ways that aren't always healthy or good. And I'm sure this doesn't feel very good at all, but you are allowed to own your individual experience with someone whilst also accepting and understanding that it hasn't been that experience for everyone. I hope that everyone involved is as okay as possible and also that justice is served correctly on the matter. Next up we have, is it bad to fantasize about other people during sex? Okay, so as with many subjects in the sexual space, this definitely comes with a scale that slides from natural to potentially problematic. When we're in long-term relationships, especially loving, happy, content ones, having a thought about another person may set off a huge spiral of guilt in your mind and cause you to panic that something is immediately wrong with your relationship. And I'm here to tell you, it's okay. It doesn't mean that you all of a sudden aren't happy in your relationship or that you're considering being unfaithful, or even really that you want to have sexual relations with the person you might be having fleeting thoughts about. Fantasizing is part of our experience as humans. We do it about many, many aspects of our lives. This is just more of an erotic daydream, and you don't need to shame or judge yourself harshly for it. Sometimes, I know this might be weird to hear, Having a little fantasy movie going on in your head every now and again can enhance your sex life. I know that we're brought up to believe that once you've picked someone, you will surely never find anyone else attractive ever again for as long as you live. 
But that's simply not true. All realistic and ideally we need to let go of that thought process and understand we are all sexual beings and just because a partner or partners might find someone else sexually attractive, it doesn't mean their desire for us is gone. Maintaining a long-term, especially monogamous sex life takes work and having sex with the same person, potentially forever, will come up against its moments of struggle. If you ate the exact same meal for the rest of your life, you may well find yourself imagining a different main course every now and again. (laughs) If it makes you feel better, roughly 80% of women and vulva owners and 98% of men and penis owners have fantasized about people other than their partner. And around 50% of people admitted to doing this whilst being intimate with their partner. Of course, there is a difference between this being the odd occurrence every so often and it becoming a recurring or even obsessive thought process, especially if it gets to a point where you feel unable to be intimate with a partner without fantasizing about another person. I know I sound like a broken record, but if it stems from a problem within your current sex life with your partner then this is something that could be looked at being mended with communicating about it. That's not to say that you need to tell your partner that you're thinking about other people whilst having sex with them. But if the issue is coming from a place that you maybe need to spice things up a bit, this could come from an open, honest conversation with your partner. Maybe role play might be something that you might look at trying together. I know that may feel difficult to do, but if you think the fantasizing may be becoming a problem, then it will be better to get to the root of the issue and look at solving it. Excessive fantasizing can become a gateway to infidelity, and that's not to say it will happen, but it can. So again, it will be worth being honest with yourself and acknowledging how often this fantasizing is taking place. And if you think there may be a deeper issue, please do consider conversing with your partner or even looking at counselling if you want to try and improve your sex life. Next up, we have, I keep getting told by my friends, or strangers actually, that I'm super flirty and sexual with everyone, but I just think I'm a normal level of tactile. Where is the line? For a start, this feels like a strange thing for strangers to be saying to you because how are they even spending enough time with you to form this opinion? Anyway, I think flirty, sexual and tactile are different topics. If we're talking about tactile, then really the line is whatever the receiving person is happy with because we're talking about consent. I'm personally only really tactile with people I'm very close to or involved with. And so if someone is ever tactile with me without my consent, I'm never particularly okay with it. But I'm also happy to bring it up and tell the person if I ever feel like they've overstepped. There's nothing wrong at all with being a tactile person. It may well be that physical touch is just your love language and so that's your go-to. But there just needs to be a level of respect for how the person on the other end may receive it. So if it's friends and strangers saying to you that they feel you are too tactile with them, then it may be they just have different physical boundaries to you, which is okay and that will need to be understood. And it's nothing to do with you, it's to do with them and their line of consent, but that line is absolutely valid and should then be adhered to. With flirting, that's a lot more broad as that can be done via words as much as it can anything physical or tactile. And I get it, I've been accused of flirting many a time when I've really just been friendly and misread the situation. But if you feel like it's a conversation that's coming up a lot and it's making you feel uncomfortable or bothering you in any way, I would talk about it with people you trust and try to understand why people may 
think that of you. At the end of the day, if it isn't your intention, it shouldn't really be a problem. But as with everything, it's not that simple. And if the reason for the majority of these conversations is that there has been a tactile behavior involved, it may well be that boundaries are being crossed. Some people will be more than comfortable with you being tactile with them. And that's great and cool that you can have that relationship with them. And so if people are commenting on those relationships from an outside space, it's not really their business whether they think you're too tactile or not. But if the comments are coming from people you've personally been tactile with, then I think it will be worth having a conversation about where people feel comfortable within that because the line is and always will be where someone feels their level of consent has been broken. Next up we have, really, I mean, we're all over the place today. Cheapest decent toy. (laughs) Listen, we know I am aggressively attached to my toys from Balesa, which I truly, truly believe are worth every penny. But I do know they can be on the more expensive side of things, although they do often have sales that are super worth it. But I do know that sex toys can be quite expensive. However, I honestly lived on an Anne Summers bullet vibrator that I bought at the counter for £5 for years. Like, it got the job done super quickly. (laughs) The downside was having to change the batteries fairly regularly. But that also depends how often you use it. But in terms of getting yourself some cheap and cheerful pleasure, I highly recommend it because you can use it in both solo and partner play. The one I bought for £5 was a long time ago, and having just had a quick little search, I believe they are ranging from about 12 to 16 now. Inflation, hey? But I would recommend that as a good place to start. There are also so many websites these days with helpful reviews so I would try popping your budget into a few and just seeing what comes up and when you do feel like you really want to treat yourself the Balesa Air Vibe is really everything you could want in a toy and more. Moving on we have when can a kink go too far? BDSM being tied up, choked, etc. I feel like there are two ways to read this question, so I'm going to try and cover both answers in the hope that one helps. And there's really a very simple answer to the physical level of BDSM going too far, and that is anything that is beyond your discussed set out boundaries or line of consent is too far. Because I would hope if you are indulging in BDSM activity that you have had those conversations. And if you haven't, then you absolutely must. And I cannot emphasize that enough. I will obviously expand on this answer. But really, that is the answer. BDSM activity requires both or all partners to be on the same page at all times. Rules and boundaries need to be set in place and absolutely cannot be broken without consent from the other partner or partners. Bondage play is a together practice. It is not a sexual practice that encourages one partner into sexual or physical abuse under the guise that it's an act of passion or desire. If you are in a BDSM relationship, the submissive partner is an active, consenting partner, not a victim. And you should have had lengthy communication about this agreement. When you are placing your safety into another person's hands, your communication about this should be incredibly clear and grounded in trust and respect. If someone is actually pushing into the territory of abuse, they are showing they don't care about the safety of their partner and can also make a partner feel guilty or scared to ask them to stop. As mentioned in my episode about fears and anxieties, I had an ex-partner who would frequently become abusive during sex and we did 
have active communication about BDSM play as it was something we were open to exploring. And when those lines of consent were crossed, it was usually made out to be my fault. I would be told I made them do it or simply that they lost control in the moment. That started with something as small as choking a little harder than is safe and not stopping immediately as requested with our chosen safe word. And over time progressed to more and more violent acts in the name of sexual desire. That's frightening and if you feel like you have a partner who is crossing your line of consent then that is a really important conversation to try and have sooner than later. And honestly, their reaction will tell you everything. As I always say, I learned my way here and I did not have those conversations because I was scared and honestly hoped if I just put up and shut up that maybe it would stop. But it didn't and it doesn't. It actually only gets worse. And I'm not being dramatic when I say I have the scars to prove it. Always remember that BDSM is supposed to create pleasure, even if that's something that's associated with pain for you. The bottom line is always sexual pleasure and mutual pleasure. It's not a way of controlling someone. So set clear boundaries and if someone is ignoring them, it's going too far. Another way I read this question is in regards to when can a kink go too far? And I read that as in a lot of people think there is something wrong with them if they have kinks that aren't the more common ones we hear of or talk about, like the ones mentioned in the question. So a lot of people who do have kinks also have a lot of self-judgment because we aren't brought up in a society that supports them. The bottom line of this is, If what you are doing with your partner or partners is safe and consensual and everyone is of sane mind at the time of play, then you are good to live out whatever kinky fantasies you have and you don't need to feel guilty about it. I will be doing a more extensive episode on kinks, fetishes and BDSM, but really, whatever it is you like, you're not weird, I promise. But at the bottom of this, consent consent, consent. Okay. Having lost your virginity to a penis owner and having sex with predominantly penis owners, how did you find it sleeping with a vulva owner for the first time? Now, I've been fairly open about this in a previous episode, but I was honestly terrified. I felt way more pressure to know what I was doing because Even though we all like different things, we have the same genitalia. And I was just like, I felt like I was expected to be confident and completely in the know. I also lost my virginity to a penis owner when I was 15. So we were both super young and literally just putting things in places and hoping we were getting it right. We didn't know a single thing about pleasure. But I first slept with a vulva owner when I was a little bit older I want to say in my early 20s, I can't remember exactly, but I do know that by the time that happened, I was a lot more informed on sex and sexual practice. I had seen lesbian porn, but that almost made it worse because again, I felt more pressure to get it right. And I say right as an idea because there is no right or wrong, but I didn't think like that at the time. Also, Losing your virginity to a penis owner is categorised as penetrative sex, whereas sex with a fellow vulva owner is all-encompassing and not defined by one specific act within the sexual hemisphere. So there was definitely a lot more exploration and playtime involved and I actually decided in the moment to just be honest and be like, I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing, which again, was completely contrasting to the first time I did anything with a penis owner, when I was really quite happy to just go for it and hope for the best. Maybe that's because I hoped a fellow vulva owner would be more understanding and 
at the age I started sleeping with penis owners, I never would have had the confidence to tell someone if I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I'd have just hoped if I was doing something wrong that they would tell me. And also, I think we all feel pressure to pretend we all think we're fantastic in bed and just know how every single person's body works and don't need any guidance. And it's absolute bullshit. Like, literally none of us have a clue person to person. The best ongoing skills you can learn are communicating, listening, and paying attention. And I was lucky that the first vulva owner I had sex with was appreciative of the openness as I would hope any partner would be, but as we know, it's not always the case. And we had amazing communication. And honestly, once I got into it, the natural instincts kicked in a bit, and then everything actually moved pretty smoothly from there. And the communication beforehand only served to make things better. Physically, I found it amazing. It's just a completely different experience. And I find generally in sexual experiences with vulva owners, mutual pleasure is a lot more present and much more of a priority than it is with penis owners. So all I can really say is if you are looking to sleep with a vulva owner for the first time and you feel nervous about it in any way, just talk about it, take it slow and enjoy the journey. Okay, next question. What do I do if my friend is super judgmental about my sexual choices, even if she says it's because she's only looking out for me? Yeah, I mean, this simply sounds to me like sex shaming. And that's a very black and white way to put it. And there will, of course, be shades of grey, as I understand that people can have concerns at come from a genuine place but really if you're happy and safe within your sexual choices then it is none of anyone else's business. Sex shouldn't be concerning or something for people to look out for you for. If you are an adult and making consensual choices that you are okay with that's all that matters. I know that it can be really hard to respond when people we trust or value express opinions like this and cover them up as concern. But if you feel like her opinions are upsetting or affecting your sex life in a negative way, you don't have to confide in that friend anymore. They aren't owed anything. They don't have a right to that part of your life. Only what you decide to tell them. People often shame others for having casual sex, but that's mostly because casual sex especially for women and vulva owners, has been stigmatised since the beginning of fucking time. And so people use it as an excuse to suggest that people will think less of someone for engaging in it. But honestly, fuck that. It's 2022 and it's time for us to live our lives beyond these outdated, judgmental societal norms. This can be a tough situation to navigate, especially if this is someone you care about, but... If your friend continues with this behaviour, I would either suggest removing yourself from conversations about this topic with them, or if you think they would be open to it, which they should, encouraging them to further their own sexual education on fighting sexual stigma and sexual shaming, and accepting that people are able to have sex that is safe, consensual and pleasurable even if that sex lays outside what they may believe to be acceptable. As long as you are happy, that's all that matters. Do not deny yourself happiness or good sex for the sake of someone's opinion. Okay, one of the most uncomfortable discussions you might ever have to have. How to deal with a partner's genitals when they smell. You love them, but don't know how to tell them. Yep, this is a super uncomfortable situation to deal with for sure. Unfortunately, because of the platform this question was sent on, I have no idea whether the partner is a penis or vulva owner, so I am going to discuss both. Either way, it's a conversation you're going to dread and dread and dread 
because there's just no easy way to approach hygiene-related conversations. But it has to happen. For a start, conversations like this are better had in a casual setting and never when you're about to be intimate with each other, when people are already in a vulnerable position. Also, sometimes conversations like this are best bookended with a compliment in order to take the edge off. So you can always start with something like, I love going down on you, but, and lead into it that way. Or you could try suggesting taking a shower together and incorporate it into your foreplay. But, If you don't approach it, you may begin to feel aversive to being intimate with your partner, which could be incredibly hurtful to your relationship. So even though there's no way to make the whole thing completely comfortable, it's better to get the conversation out there sooner than later and let them know you want to work through it together. Make sure they feel respected and supported because the likelihood is they are going to feel embarrassed. If your partner is a penis owner, it will most likely be to do with a personal hygiene habit or even things that they're eating than it is any kind of medical issue. If your partner is a vulva owner, it might not be that simple. I know that men and penis owners often feel uncomfortable to bring up conversations about these things because as I learned from my previous conversation with Katie about vaginismus, They have been kept pretty much in the dark in terms of education about vaginas. But if you are a male or penis owner with a female or vulva owner partner, educating yourself more on the vulva could help your relationship moving forward. It may be that your partner has something like bacterial vaginosis, which is super, super common, but literally never talked about. It is also something that is best solved sooner rather than later because it can be difficult to treat the longer it goes on. And outside of bad hygiene practice, something that causes an unpleasant odour generally stems from a bacterial nature. Your partner may not even be aware they have a problem or how bad it is or what the implications for your sex life or even their sexual health are. So it's a conversation that has important stakes for both of you. I will say as well, when we are sexually aroused, our bodies produce completely different smells. Hence why we walk into rooms and say they smell of sex. But again, these shouldn't be unpleasant. And we should be able to tell the difference between our personal preference in the way someone or something smells as opposed to something actually being wrong. Try to think if your partner felt this way about you, you'd want them to say something, right? You wouldn't want them to keep quiet and over time stop going down on you or being sexual with you. It would be embarrassing, of course, But your sexual relationship is important and deserves these conversations. Reassure your partner that it doesn't affect the way you feel about them. Make sure they feel supported and loved. But have the conversation. I'm sending you luck. I know it's going to be difficult, but you've got this. Okay. If I'm straight but have a potential attraction to my same-sex friend, what do I do? It would be very, very easy for me to sit here and say, baby, maybe you aren't explicitly straight. But these attractions can be super confusing and scary, especially the first time they happen. Discovering new feelings and attractions towards a friend that you're close with can be confusing enough as it is. But I know that battle with the feelings of desire for someone of the same gender because I've been there. For me, it turned out it was a path I wanted to go down and that's not to say it would or will be the same for you but in case it is, it is okay and will be okay. I don't know how close your friendship is with this person but 
it will probably come as no surprise for me to suggest or ask if maybe you could talk about your feelings with them. I also don't know their sexual orientation, but if they are a part of the LGBTQ plus community, they might be able to chat through it with you and give you some insight into what your feelings could mean. That might not be for everyone, but as someone who identifies within that community, if someone felt that way towards me, I would want them to be honest and I would want to be the person to chat it out with them and help them to understand their feelings. If it's any help, it is very, very common for heterosexual people to have desires for people of the same gender at points throughout their lives. And that could be because of a specific person or even a particular environment you're in at the time. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to label yourself something different. I mean, everything has a label these days, doesn't it? But actually, you're well within your rights to simply be figuring it out for as long as you goddamn like. I do think that the way our feelings and emotions move is super important. And so allow yourself the time to think about it in terms of how do you usually feel when you are attracted to someone? Is it the same? Take a moment to think about it and also reflect on where the feeling started and what you think they really mean to you. That can all take some time to process and really, there's no rush. You may find that the attraction passes through and that doesn't mean it isn't and wasn't a genuine attraction. It may well just be fleeting. If you've taken the time for some self-reflection, find that these feelings are lingering, it may eventually be worth having the conversation with that friend as it may be difficult to continue your friendship with alternative feelings bubbling below the surface. And although it can be hard, once things are out in the open, you may well feel like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders. I really hope you start to have a little more clarity on your feelings, but do feel free to follow up and let me know how things are going because I empathise that this can be a very confusing situation. Okay, it's time for the penultimate question. And it's another version of the question that I get asked the most. How do you make your girlfriend feel more comfortable and want to be adventurous? She won't even use a vibrator, let alone wear any nice underwear. Yep, Asking how to get a partner to be more adventurous in the bedroom is by far the most common question I ever get asked. And it's difficult because our sexual appetite is unique to each and every single one of us. We all have the things we like and the things we don't. Sometimes it will come down to the sad and difficult fact that maybe two people aren't sexually compatible. If one party likes things a little bit more vanilla and the other is into the kinkiest behaviour out there and there's no meeting in the middle, that might be a sexual collaboration that is just not going to work out. However, we want to try our best to make it work before we have to consider that as an option. Obviously, there is hopefully always space for trying something new, But some people do seem to be staunchly against that. And when one partner is reluctant to try new possibilities, it can feel like a burden to the other partner to have to constantly encourage that exploration. And you're within your rights to discuss your sexual needs and wants, as is your partner. However, there are ways to encourage it that will have way more success than others. And if these conversations are handled poorly, it can ruin a partner's self-esteem and push you even further away from your goal. So most importantly, these conversations need to come from a reassuring and nurturing place because you will need to encourage her to feel sexy and confident and desirable. Rather than springing something on her in a sexual moment, and potentially leaving her feeling pressured or confused, 
ask if you can have a real conversation about your sex lives together and let her know how important it is to you to build your intimacy and prioritise each other's pleasure. People won't feel compelled to look outside their sexual comfort zone and explore if they feel like their current bedroom style is being criticised. So I cannot emphasise enough how important it is to bring praise into this conversation as it will make them feel genuinely safe and loved and boost their ego. They'll most likely be more open to take things to the next step if you do this. And then it's going to be a case of taking things slowly and building up. And if you're realistically looking to be in a long-term relationship with this person, then luckily you have time. If you want to try a toy, also love that for you, here for the partners who want to incorporate toys into the bedroom, maybe you could suggest trying a vibrating cock ring. That way it's something you will be wearing, but she will be able to feel the sensation of it and that might make her want to explore toys a little further, maybe even a vibrator specifically for her. That may also not be for her, but I would think that would be a good place to start with it. Or even a very small bullet that could be used on her during penetration purely to enhance her pleasure in that moment. It's difficult when someone hasn't tried something because it could really be a case of her feeling scared. But she really just doesn't know what she's missing and how much pleasure could be awaiting her. I would also, in conversation, ask her how she feels about your sex life. Ask her if there's anything she would like more of, anything she feels you could do better in terms of her pleasure, as well as anything she's really been enjoying, and explore how she feels within your sexual encounters. Is there any chance she could also be wanting something more but feels too afraid to ask or bring it up? I would sincerely hope that those questions will then be asked in return. And then comes the time to have a kind but honest moment to voice these feelings. Even though it all might feel awkward for a minute, the earlier on you can have these conversations, the better things will be. Basically, as much as you possibly can, make the conversation very, I love you, I love our sex life and I want us to go on this sexual journey together and explore these things as a team. Make sure she knows it's a collaboration rather than suggesting you are unhappy with your sex life or making her feel like she has done something wrong, which will just likely make her feel inadequate and defensive. Start out with small things You don't want to come home with a basket full of sex toys if you haven't had a sexually adventurous experience thus far. So take little steps towards a more explorative path and it will become a lot easier for a partner to adapt to if they err on the side of being shy or apprehensive. I'm sending you luck for this. I really hope it goes well. And just remember you're both deserving of pleasure and putting that time into each other. Final question of today. Would you ever publish a sex tape, erotic novel, or start an OnlyFans? As with everything, I will always reserve the right to change my mind. However, it's not something I can really see myself doing. I had a very unfortunate experience with an ex-partner who published a private sex tape that we had made on a porn site after we broke up and it was a lot of trouble to get it removed and obviously made me feel pretty exposed and violated. For me, those things are more of a private event with a partner or partners, although it took me a while to rebuild trust to let someone do that again after the fact. I respect anyone who wants to start an OnlyFans, even though I have some mixed and conflicting feelings about the platform as a whole. But again, it's not a path I'm currently expecting I'll take. An erotic novel probably sounds like the most likely of these options that I'd consider because I also love reading erotica myself. 
But for now, I'm mostly concentrating more on the educational side of sex so that I can continue to help guide people towards their best sexual lives and experiences. That being said, I am desperate to design my own sex toy. So fingers crossed, one day I'll be able to collaborate with a company and look into doing that. Okay, so thank you so much to everyone who sent in questions for today's Ask Peach. I will be doing more in the future and I answered as many as I possibly could for today. As always, some questions are much better suited for further episodes with guests who have lived experiences of the answers and so I want to save them so that everyone can get the best possible response that they deserve. I really appreciate anyone tuning in today and if you need or want to follow up to any of the questions from today, please do feel free to do so at either my not gonna lie anonymous link or you can email me or DM me at the details in the outro of the podcast. But for now, I will see you next hump day for more sex shenanigans. Thanks for coming. Thank you for tuning in to Sex on the Peach today and I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find and follow me on Instagram, YouTube and TikTok at Sex on the Peach Cast and you can also get in touch with me at sexonthepeachcast at gmail.com. Please do continue to like, share, subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts and I'll see you next week. Love, Peach. <laughs>